chapter five of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five hawkins and the fighting traitors said francis the first of france to charles v king of spain your majesty and the king of portugal have divided the world between you offering no part of it to me show me i pray you the will of our father adam so that i may see if he has really made you his only universal heirs then francis sent out the italian navigator verrazano who first explored the coast from florida to newfoundland afterwards jacques cartier discovered the st lawrence frenchmen took havana twice plundered the spanish treasure ships and tried to found colonies catholic in canada protestant in florida and brazil thus at the time when elizabeth ascended the throne of england in fifteen hundred and fifty eight there was a long-established new spain extending over mexico the west indies and most of south america a small new portugal confined to part of brazil and a shadowy new france running vaguely inland from the gulf of st lawrence nowhere effectively occupied and mostly overlapping prior english claims based on the discoveries of the cabots england and france had often been enemies england and spain had just been allied in a war against france as well as by the marriage of philip and mary william hawkins had traded with portuguese brazil under henry the eighth as the southampton merchants were to do later on english merchants lived in lisbon and cadiz a few were even settled in new spain and a friendly spaniard had been so delighted by the prospective union of the english with the spanish crown that he had given the name of londres london to a new settlement in the argentine andes presently however elizabethan england began to part company with spain to become more anti-papal to sympathize with huguenots and other heretics and like francis i to wonder why an immense new world should be nothing but new spain besides englishmen knew what the rest of europe knew that the discovery of potosi had put out of business nearly all the old world silver mines and that the burgundian ass as spanish treasure mules were called from charles's love of burgundy had enabled spain to make conquests impose her will on her neighbours and keep paid spies in every foreign court the english court included londoners had seen spanish gold and silver paraded through the streets when philip married mary twenty-seven chests of bullion ninety-nine horse-loads plus two cart-loads of gold and silver coin and ninety-seven boxes full of silver bars moreover the holy inquisition was making spanish seaports pretty hot for heretics in fifteen hundred and sixty-two twenty-six english subjects were burnt alive in spain itself ten times as many were in prison no wonder sea-dogs were straining at the leash neither philip nor elizabeth wanted war just then though each enjoyed a thrust at the other by any kind of fighting short of that and though each winked at all kinds of armed trade such as privateering and even downright piracy the english and spanish merchants had commercial connections going back for centuries and business men on both sides were always ready to do a good stroke for themselves this was the state of affairs in fifteen hundred and sixty two when young john hawkins son of old master william went into the slave trade with new spain except for the fact that both portugal and spain allowed no trade with their oversea possessions in any ships but their own the circumstances appeared to favour his enterprise the american indians were withering away before the atrocious cruelties of the portuguese and spaniards being either killed in battle used up in merciless slavery or driven off to alien wilds already the portuguese had commenced to import negroes from their west african possessions both for themselves and for trade with the spaniards who had none 
brazil prospered beyond expectation and absorbed all the blacks that portuguese shipping could supply the spaniards had no spare tonnage at the time john hawkins aged thirty had made several trips to the canaries he now formed a joint stock company to trade with the spaniards farther off two lord mayors of london and the treasurer of the royal navy were among the subscribers three small vessels with only two hundred and sixty tons between them formed the flotilla the crews numbered just a hundred men at teneriffe he received friendly treatment from thence he passed to sierra leona where he stayed a good time and got into his possession partly by the sword and partly by other means to the number of three hundred negroes at the least besides other merchandises with this prey he sailed over the ocean sea unto the island of hispaniola haiti and here he had reasonable utterance sale of his english commodities as also of some part of his negroes trusting the spaniards no further than that by his own strength he was able still to master them at monte christi another port on the north side of hispaniola he made vent of sold the whole number of his negroes for which he received by way of exchange such a quantity of merchandise that he did not only lade his own three ships with hides ginger sugars and some quantity of pearls but he freighted also to other hulks with hides and other like commodities which he sent into spain where both hulks and hides were confiscated as being contraband nothing daunted he was off again in fifteen hundred and sixty four with four ships and a hundred and seventy men this time elizabeth herself took shares and lent the jesus of lubeck a vessel of seven hundred tons which henry the eighth had bought for the navy nobody questioned slavery in those days the great spanish missionary las casas denounced the spanish atrocities against the indians but he thought negroes who could be domesticated would do as substitutes for indians who could not be domesticated the indians withered at the white man's touch the negroes if properly treated throve and were safer than among their enemies at home such was the argument for slavery and it was true so far as it went the argument against on the score of ill-treatment was only gradually heard on the score of general human rights it was never heard at all at departing in cutting the foresail lashings a marvellous misfortune happened to one of the officers in the ship who by the pulley of the sheet was slain out of hand hawkins appointed all the masters of his ships an order for the keeping of good company in this manner the small ships to be always ahead and a weather of the jesus and to speak twice a day with the jesus at least if the weather be extreme that the small ships cannot keep company with the jesus then all to keep company with the solomon if any happen to any misfortune then to show two lights and to shoot off a piece of ordnance if any lose company and come in sight again to make three yaws zigzags in their course and strike the mizzen three times serve god daily love one another preserve your victuals beware of fire and keep good company john spark the chronicler of this second voyage was full of curiosity over every strange sight he met with he was also blessed with the pen of a ready writer so we get a story that is more vivacious than hacklet's retelling of the first voyage or hawkins's own account of the third spark saw for the first time in his life negroes caribs indians alligators flying fish flamingos pelicans and many other strange sights having been told that florida was full of unicorns he at once concluded that it must also be full of lions for how could the one kind exist without the other kind to balance it spark was a soldier who never found his sea legs but his diary besides its other merits is particularly interesting as being the first account of america ever written by an english eye-witness hawkins made for teneriffe in the canaries off the west of africa there to everybody's great amaze the spaniards appeared levelling of bases small portable cannon and arquebuses with divers others to the number of fourscore with halberds pikes swords and targets but when it was found that hawkins had been taken for a privateer 
and when it is remembered that four hundred privateering vessels english and huguenot had captured seven hundred spanish prizes during the previous summer of fifteen hundred and sixty three there was and is less cause for amaze once explanations had been made peter de ponta gave master hawkins as gentle entertainment as if he had been his own brother peter was a traitor with a great eye for the main chance spark was lost in wonder over the famous arbol santo tree of faro by the dropping whereof the inhabitants and cattle are satisfied with water for other water they have none on the island this is not quite the traveller's tale it appears to be there are three springs on the island of teneriffe but water is scarce and the arbol santo a sort of gigantic laurel standing alone on a rocky ledge did actually supply two cisterns one for men and the other for cattle the morning mist condensing on the innumerable smooth leaves ran off and was caught in suitable conduits in africa hawkins took many sapies which do inhabit about rio grande now the jeba river which do jag their flesh both legs arms and bodies as workmanlike as a jerkin maker with us pinketh a jerkin it is a nice question whether these sapies gained or lost by becoming slaves to white men for they were already slaves to black conquerors who used them as meat with the vegetables they forced them to raise the sapies were sleek pacifists who found too late that the warlike samboses who inhabited the neighbouring desert were not to be denied in the island of sambula we found almides or canoas which are made of one piece of wood digged out like a trough but of a good proportion being about eight yards long and one in breadth having a beak head and a stern very proportionably made and on the outside artificially carved and painted red and blue neither almady nor canoa is of course an african word one is arabic for a cradle el mad the other from which we get canoe is what the natives told columbus they call their dugouts and dugout canoes are very like primitive cradles thus spark was the first man to record in english from actual experience the aboriginal craft whose name both east and west was suggested to primeval man by the idea of his being literally rocked in the cradle of the deep hawkins did not have it all his own way with the negroes by whom he once lost seven of his own men killed and twenty-seven wounded but the captain in a singular wise manner carried himself with countenance very cheerful outwardly although inwardly his heart was broken in pieces for it done to this end that the portugals being with him should not presume to resist against him after losing five more men who were eaten by sharks hawkins shaped his course westward with a good cargo of negroes and other merchandises contrary winds and some tornadoes happened to us very ill but the almighty god who never suffereth his elect to perish sent us the ordinary breeze which never left us till we came to an island of the cannibals caribs of dominica who by the by had just eaten a shipload of spaniards hawkins found the spanish officials determined to make a show of resisting unauthorized trade but when he prepared one hundred men well armed with bows arrows arquebuses and pikes with which he marched townwards the officials let the sale of blacks go on hawkins was particularly anxious to get rid of his lean negroes who might die in his hands and become a dead loss so he used the gunboat argument to good effect spark kept his eyes open for side shows and was delighted with the alligators which he called crocodiles perhaps for the sake of the crocodile tears his nature is to cry and sob like a christian to provoke his prey to come to him and thereupon came this proverb that is applied unto women when they weep lacrimae quo cockadilly from the west indies hawkins made for florida which was then an object of exceptional desire among adventurous englishmen de soto one of pizarro's lieutenants had annexed it to spain and in fifteen hundred and thirty nine had started off inland to discover the supposed peru of north america three years later he had died while descending the valley of the mississippi six years later again the first spanish missionary in florida taking upon him to persuade the people to subjection was by them taken and his skin cruelly pulled over his ears and his flesh eaten hawkins's men had fair warning on the way for they being ashore found a dead man 
dried in a manner whole with other heads and bodies of men apparently smoked like hams but to return to our purpose as the indefatigable spark the captain in the ship's pinnace sailed along the shore and went into every creek speaking with divers of the floridians because he would understand where the frenchmen inhabited finally he found them in the river of may now st john's river and standing in thirty degrees and better there was great store of maize and mill and grapes of great bigness also deer great plenty which came upon the sands before them so here were the three rivals overlapping again the annexing spaniards the would-be colonizing french and the persistently trading english there were however no spaniards about at that time this was the second huguenot colony in florida rene de laudonniere had founded it in fifteen hundred and sixty four the first one founded two years earlier by jean ribaud had failed and ribaud's men had deserted the place they had started for home in fifteen hundred and sixty three had suffered terrible hardships had been picked up by an english vessel and taken some to france and some to england where the court was all agog about the wealth of florida people said there were mines so bright with jewels that they had to be approached at night lest the flashing light should strike men blind florida became proverbial and elizabethan wits made endless fun of it stolida or the land of fools and sordida or the land of muckworms were some of their jeux d'esprit every one was bound for florida whether he meant to go there or not despite spanish spheres of influence the native cannibals and pirates by the way hawkins on the contrary did not profess to be bound for florida nevertheless he arrived there and probably had intended to do so from the first for he took with him a frenchman who had been in ribaud's colony two years before and spark significantly says that the land is more than any one king christian is able to inhabit however this may be hawkins found the second french colony as well as a french ship of four score ton and two pinnaces of fifteen ton apiece by her and a fort in which their captain m Donnière was with certain soldiers therein the colony had not been a success nor is this to be wondered at when we remember that most of the certain soldiers were ex-pirates who wanted gold and who would not take the pains so much as to fish in the river before their doors but would have all things put in their mouths eighty of the original two hundred went a-roving to the west indies where they spoiled the spaniards and were of such haughty stomachs that they thought their force to be such that no man durst meddle with them but god did endure it their hearts in such sort that they lingered so long that a spanish ship and galeasa being made out of st domingo took twenty of them whereof the most part were hanged and twenty-five escaped to florida where they were put into prison by laudonniere against whom they had mutinied and four of the chiefest being condemned at the request of the soldiers did pass the arquebusers and then were hanged upon a gibbet spark got the delightful expression at the request of the soldiers did pass the arquebusers from a very polite frenchman could any one tell you more politely in mistranslated language how to stand up and be shot spark was greatly taken with the unknown art of smoking the floridians have an herb dried who with a cane and an earthen cup in the end with fire and the dried herbs put together do suck through the cane the smoke thereof which smoke satisfieth their hunger and therewith they live four or five days without meat or drink and this all the frenchmen use for this purpose yet do they hold opinion withal that it causeth water and steam to void from their stomachs the other commodities of the land were more than are yet known to any man but hawkins was bent on trade not colonizing he sold the tiger a bark of fifty tons to laudonniere for seven hundred crowns and sailed north on the first voyage ever made along the coast of the united states by an all english crew turning east off newfoundland with a good large wind the twenty to september fifteen hundred and sixty five we came to padstow in cornwall god be thanked in safety with the loss of twenty persons in all the voyage and with great profit to the venturers as also to the whole realm in bringing home both gold and silver pearls and other jewels great store his name therefore be praised for evermore amen hawkins was now a rich man a favourite at court and quite the rage in london the queen was very gracious and granted him the well-known coat of arms with the crest of a 
demi moor bounden captive in honour of the great new english slave trade the spanish ambassador met him at court and asked him to dinner where over the wine hawkins assured him that he was going out again next year meanwhile however the famous captain-general of the indian trade don pedro menendez de aviles the best naval officer that spain perhaps has ever had swooped down on the french in florida killed them all and built the fort of st augustine to guard the mountains of bright stone somewhere in the hinterland news of this slaughter soon arrived at madrid whence orders presently went out to have an eye on hawkins whom spanish officials thenceforth regarded as the leading interloper in new spain nevertheless hawkins set out on his third and very troublesome voyage in fifteen hundred and sixty seven backed by all his old and many new supporters and with a flotilla of six vessels the jesus the minion which then meant darling the william and john the judith the angel and the swallow this was the voyage that began those twenty years of sea-dog fighting which rose to their zenith in the battle against the armada and with this voyage drake himself steps on to the stage as captain of the judith there had been a hitch in fifteen hundred and sixty six for the spanish ambassador has reported hawkins's after-dinner speech to his king philip had protested to elizabeth and elizabeth had consulted with cecil afterwards the great lord burleigh ancestor of the marquis of salisbury british prime minister during the spanish-american war of eighteen hundred and ninety eight the result was that orders went down to plymouth stopping hawkins and binding him over in a bond of five hundred pounds to keep the peace with her majesty's right good friend king philip of spain but in fifteen hundred and sixty seven times had changed again and hawkins sailed with colours flying for elizabeth was now as ready to hurt philip as he was to hurt her provided always that open war was carefully avoided but this time things went wrong from the first a tremendous autumnal storm scattered the ships then the first negroes that hawkins tried to snare proved to be like that other kind of prey of which the sarcastic frenchman wrote this animal is very wicked when you attack it it defends itself the envenomed arrows of the negroes worked the mischief there hardly escaped any that had blood drawn of them but died in strange sort with their mouths that shut some ten days before they died hawkins himself was wounded but thanks be to god escaped the lockjaw after this the english took sides in a native war and captured two hundred and fifty persons men women and children while their friend the king captured six hundred prisoners whereof we hoped to have had our choice but the negro in which nation is seldom or never found truth that night removed his camp and prisoners so that we were fain to content ourselves with those few we had gotten ourselves however with between four hundred and five hundred negroes hawkins crossed over from africa to the west indies and coasted from place to place making our traffic with the spaniards as we might somewhat hardly because the king had straitly commanded all his governors by no means to suffer any trade to be made with us notwithstanding we had reasonable trade and courteous entertainment for a good part of the way in rio de la hacha the spaniards received the english with a volley that killed a couple of men whereupon the english smashed in the gates while the spaniards retired but after this little bit of punctilio trade went on under cover of night so briskly that two hundred negroes were sold at good prices from there to cartagena the inhabitants were glad of us and traded willingly supply being short and demand extra high then came a real rebuff from the governor of cartagena followed by a terrific storm which so beat the jesus that we cut down all her higher buildings deck superstructures then the course was shaped for florida but a new storm drove the battered flotilla back to the port which serveth the city of mexico called st john de ulia the modern vera cruz the historic vera cruz was fifteen miles north of this harbour here thinking us to be the fleet of spain the chief officers of the country came aboard us which being deceived of their expectation were greatly dismayed but when they saw our demand was nothing but victuals, were recomforted i for it is hawkins own story found in the same port twelve ships which had in them by report two hundred thousand pounds in gold and silver all which being in my possession that is at my mercy with the king's island i set at liberty 
what was to be done hawkins had a hundred negroes still to sell but it was four hundred miles to mexico city and back again and a new spanish viceroy was aboard the big spanish fleet that was daily expected to arrive in this very port if a permit to sell came back from the capital in time well and good if no more than time to replenish stores was allowed good enough despite the loss of sails but what if the spanish fleet arrived the king's island was a low little reef right in the mouth of the harbour which it all but barred moreover no vessel could live through a northerly gale inside the harbour the only one on that coast unless securely moored to the island itself consequently whoever held the island commanded the situation altogether there was not much time for consultation for the very next morning we saw open of the haven thirteen great ships the fleet of spain it was a terrible predicament now said i i am in two dangers and forced to receive the one of them either i must have kept out the fleet which with god's help i was very well able to do or else suffer them to enter with their accustomed treason if i had kept them out then there had been present shipwreck of all that fleet which amounted in value to six millions which was in value of our money one million eight hundred thousand pounds which i considered i was not able to answer fearing the queen's majesty's indignation thus with myself revolving the doubts i thought better to abide the jut of the uncertainty than of the certainty so after conditions had been agreed upon and hostages exchanged the thirteen spanish ships sailed in the little island remained in english hands and the spaniards were profuse in promises but having secretly made their preparations the spaniards who were in overwhelming numbers suddenly set upon the english by land and sea every englishman ashore was killed except a few who got off in a boat to the jesus the jesus and the minion cut their head fast hauled clear by their stern fasts drove back the boarding parties and engaged the spanish fleet at about a hundred yards within an hour the spanish flagship and another were sunk a third vessel was burning furiously fore and aft while every english deck was clear of enemies but the spaniards had swarmed on to the island from all sides and were firing into the english hulls at only a few feet from the cannon's mouth hawkins was cool as ever calling for a tankard of beer he drank to the health of the gunners who accounted for most of the five hundred and forty men killed on the spanish side stand by your ordnance lustily he cried as he put the tankard down and a round shot sent it flying god hath delivered me he added and so will he deliver you from these traitors and villains the masts of the jesus went by the board and her old strained timbers splintered loosened up and were stove in under the storm of cannon balls hawkins then gave the order to abandon ship after taking out what stores they could and changing her berth so that she would shield the little minion but while this desperate manoeuvre was being executed down came two fire-ships some of the minions crew then lost their heads and made sail so quickly that hawkins himself was nearly left behind the only two english vessels that escaped were the minion and the judith when nothing else was left to do hawkins shouted to drake to lay the judith aboard the minion take in all the men and stores he could and put to sea drake then only twenty-three did this with consummate skill hawkins followed some time after and anchored just out of range but drake had already gained an offing that caused the two little vessels to part company in the night during which a whole gale from the north sprang up threatening to put the judith on a lee shore drake therefore fought his way to windward and seeing no one when the gale abated and having barely enough stores to make a friendly land sailed straight home hawkins reported the judith without mentioning drake's name as forsaking the minion but no other witness thought drake to blame hawkins himself rode out the gale under the lee of a little island then beat about for two weeks of increasing misery when hides were thought very good meat and rats cats mice and dogs parrots and monkeys that were got at great price none escaped the minion was of three hundred tons and so was insufferably overcrowded with three hundred men two hundred english and one hundred negroes drake's little judith of only fifty tons could have given no relief as she was herself over full hawkins asked all the men who preferred to take their chance on land to get round the foremast and all those who wanted to remain afloat to get round the mizzen about a hundred chose one course and a hundred the other the landing took place about a hundred and fifty miles south of the rio grande the shore party nearly all died but three lived to write of their adventures david ingram 
following indian trails all round the gulf of mexico and up the atlantic seaboard came out where st john new brunswick stands now was picked up by a passing frenchman and so got safely home job hortop and miles phillips were caught by the spaniards and sent back to mexico phillips escaped to england fourteen years later but hortop was sent to spain where he served twelve years as a galley slave and ten as a servant before he contrived to get aboard an english vessel the ten spanish hostages were found safe and sound aboard the jesus though by all the rules of war hawkins would have been amply justified in killing them the english hostages were kept fast prisoners if all the miseries of this sorrowful voyage says hawkins's report should be perfectly written there should need a painful man with his pen and as great a time as he had that wrote the lives and deaths of martyrs thus in complete disaster ended that third voyage to new spain on which so many hopes were set and with this disastrous end began those twenty years of sea-dog rage which found their satisfaction against the great armada End of chapter five chapter six of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six drake's beginning we must now turn back for a moment to fifteen hundred and forty five the year in which the old world after the discovery of the mines of potosi first awoke to the illimitable riches of the new the year in which king henry assembled his epoch-making fleet the year too in which the british national anthem was so to say born at sea when the parole throughout the waiting fleet was god save the king and the answering countersign was long to reign over us in the same year at crowndale by tavistock in devon was born francis drake greatest of sea-dogs and first of modern admirals his father edmund drake was a skipper in modest circumstances but from time immemorial there had been drakes all round the countryside of tavistock and the family name stood high francis was called after his godfather francis russell son and heir of henry's right-hand reforming peer lord russell progenitor of the dukes of bedford down to the present day though fortune thus seemed to smile upon drake's cradle his boyhood proved to be a very stormy one indeed he was not yet five when the protestant zeal of the lord protector somerset stirred the roman catholics of the west country into an insurrection that swept the anti-papal minority before it like flotsam before a flood drake's father was a zealous protestant a hot gospeller much given to preaching and when he was cast up by the storm on what is now drake's island just off plymouth he was glad to take passage for kent his friends at court then made him a sort of naval chaplain to the men who took care of his majesty's ships laid up in gillingham reach on the river medway just below where chatham dockyard stands to-day here in a vessel too old for service most of drake's eleven brothers were born to a life as nearly amphibious as the life of any boy could be the tide runs in with a rush from the sea at sheerness only ten miles away and so among the creeks and marshes points and bends through tortuous channels and hurrying waters lashed by the keen east wind of england drake revelled in the kind of playground that a sea-dog's son should have during the reign of mary fifteen hundred and fifty three to fifty eight hot gospelers like drake's father were of course turned out of the service and so young francis had to be apprenticed to the master of a bark which he used to coast along the shore and sometimes to carry merchandise into zealand and france 
it was hard work and a rough life for the little lad of ten but drake stuck to it and so pleased the old man by his industry that being a bachelor at his death he bequeathed his bark unto him by will and testament moreover after elizabeth's accession drake's father came into his own he took orders in the church of england and in fifteen hundred and sixty one when francis was sixteen became vicar of upchurch on the medway the same river on which his boys had learned to live amphibious lives no dreams of any golden west had drake as yet to the boy in his teens westward ho meant nothing more than the usual cry of london boatmen touting for fares upstream but before he went out with sir john hawkins on the troublesome voyage which we have just followed he must have had a foretaste of something like his future raiding of the spanish main for the channel swarmed with protestant privateers no gentler when they caught a spaniard than spaniards were when they caught them he was twenty-two when he went out with hawkins and would be in his twenty-fourth year when he returned to england in the little judith after the murderous spanish treachery at san juan de ulia just as the winter night was closing in on the twentieth of january fifteen hundred and sixty nine the judith sailed into plymouth drake landed william hawkins john's brother wrote a petition to the queen and council for letters of mark in reprisal for ulua and drake dashed off for london with the missive almost before the ink was dry now it happened that a spanish treasure fleet carrying money from italy and bound for antwerp had been driven into plymouth and neighbouring ports by huguenot privateers this money was urgently needed by alva the very capable but ruthless governor of the spanish netherlands who having just drowned the rebellious dutch in blood was now erecting a colossal statue to himself for having extinguished sedition chastised rebellion restored religion secured justice and established peace the spanish ambassador therefore obtained leave to bring it over land to dover but no sooner had elizabeth signed the order of safe conduct than in came drake with the news of san juan de ulua elizabeth at once saw that all the english sea-dogs would be flaming for revenge every one saw that the treasure would be safer now in england than aboard any spanish vessel in the channel so on the ground that the gold though payable to philip's representative in antwerp was still the property of the italian bankers who advanced it elizabeth sent orders down post haste to commandeer it the enraged ambassador advised alva to seize everything english in the netherlands elizabeth in turn seized everything spanish in england elizabeth now held the diplomatic trumps for existing treaties provided that there should be no reprisals without a reasonable delay and alva had seized english property before giving elizabeth the customary time to explain john hawkins entered plymouth five days later than drake and started for london with four pack-horses carrying all he had saved from the wreck by the irony of fate he travelled up to town in the rear of the long procession that carried the commandeered spanish gold the plot thickened fast for england was now on the brink of war with france over the secret aid englishmen had been giving to the huguenots at la rochelle but suddenly elizabeth was all smiles and affability for france and when her two great merchant fleets put out to sea one the wine fleet bound for la rochelle went with only a small naval escort just enough to keep the pirates off 
while the other the big wool fleet usually sent to antwerp but now bound for hamburg went with a strong fighting escort of regular men of war aboard this escort went francis drake as a lieutenant in the royal navy home in june drake ran down to tavistock in devon wooed won and married pretty mary newman all within a month he was back on duty in july for the time being the war cloud passed away elizabeth's tortuous diplomacy had succeeded owing to dissension among her enemies in the following year fifteen hundred and seventy the international situation was changed by the pope who issued a bull formally deposing elizabeth and absolving her subjects from their allegiance to her the french and spanish monarchs refused to publish this order because they did not approve of deposition by the pope but for all that it worked against elizabeth by making her the official standing enemy of rome at the same time it worked for her among the sea-dogs and all who thought with them the case said thomas fuller author of the worthies of england the case was clear in sea divinity religious zeal and commercial enterprise went hand in hand the case was clear and the english navy now mobilized and ready for war made it much clearer still westward ho in chief command at the age of twenty-five with the tiny flotilla of the dragon and the swan manned by as good a lot of daredevil experts as any privateer could wish to see out and back in fifteen hundred and seventy and again in fifteen hundred and seventy one drake took reprisals on new spain made money for all hands engaged and gained a knowledge of the american coast that stood him in good stead for future expeditions it was fifteen hundred and seventy two when drake at the age of twenty seven sailed out of plymouth on the nombre de dios expedition that brought him into fame he led a lilliputian fleet the pasca and the swan a hundred tons between them with seventy-three men all ranks and ratings aboard of them but both vessels were richly furnished with victuals and apparels for a whole year and no less heedfully provided with all manner of ammunition artillery which then meant every kind of firearm as well as cannon artificers stuffs and tools but especially three dainty pinnaces made in plymouth taken asunder all in pieces and stowed aboard to be set up as occasion served without once striking sail drake made the channel between dominica and martinique in twenty-five days and arrived off a previously chosen secret harbour on the spanish main towards the end of july to his intense surprise a column of smoke was rising from it though there was no settlement within a hundred miles on landing he found a leaden plate with this inscription captain drake if you fortune to come to this port make haste away for the spaniards which you had with you here the last year have bewrayed the place and taken away all that you left here i depart hence this present seventh of july fifteen hundred and seventy two your very loving friend john garrett that was fourteen days before drake however was determined to carry out his plan so he built a fort and set up his pinnaces but others had now found the secret harbour for in came three sail under rance an englishman who asked that he be taken into partnership which was done then the combined forces not much over a hundred strong stole out and along the coast to the isle of pines where again drake found himself forestalled from the negro crews of two spanish vessels he discovered that only six weeks earlier the maroons had annihilated a spanish force on the isthmus and nearly taken nombre de dios itself 
these maroons were the descendants of escaped negro slaves intermarried with the most warlike of the indians they were regular desperadoes always and naturally at war with the spaniards who treated them as vermin to be killed at sight drake put the captured negroes ashore to join the maroons with whom he always made friends then with seventy-three picked men he made his dash for nombre de dios leaving the rest under rance to guard the base nombre de dios was the atlantic terminus as panama was the pacific terminus of the treasure trail across the isthmus of darien the spaniards knowing nothing of cape horn and unable to face the appalling dangers of magellan's straits used to bring the peruvian treasure ships to panama whence the treasure was taken across the isthmus to nombre de dios by recuas that is by mule trains under escort at evening drake's vessel stood off the harbour of nombre de dios and stealthily approached unseen it was planned to make the landing in the morning a long and nerve-wracking wait ensued as the hours dragged on drake felt instinctively that his younger men were getting demoralized they began to whisper about the size of the town as big as plymouth with perhaps a whole battalion of the famous spanish infantry and so on it wanted an hour of the first real streak of dawn but just then the old moon sent a ray of light quivering in on the tide drake instantly announced the dawn issued the orders shove off out oars give way inside the bay a ship just arrived from sea was picking up her moorings a boat left her side and pulled like mad for the wharf but drake's men raced the spaniards beat them and made them sheer off to a landing some way beyond the town springing eagerly ashore the englishmen tumbled the spanish guns off their platforms while the astonished sentry ran for dear life in five minutes the church bells were pealing out their wild alarms trumpet calls were sounding drums were beating round the general parade and the civilians of the place expecting massacre at the hands of the maroons were rushing about in agonized confusion drake's men fell in they were all well drilled and were quickly told off into three detachments the largest under drake the next under oxenham the hero of kingsley's westward ho and the third of twelve men only to guard the pinnaces having found that the new fort on the hill commanding the town was not yet occupied drake and oxenham marched against the town at the head of their sixty men oxenham by a flank drake straight up the main street each with a trumpet sounding a drum rolling fire pikes blazing swords flashing and all ranks yelling like fiends drake was only of medium stature but he had the strength of a giant the pluck of a bulldog the spring of a tiger and the cut of a man that is born to command broad-browed with steel-blue eyes and close-cropped auburn hair and beard he was all kindliness of countenance to friends but a very dragon to his spanish foes as drake's men reached the plaza his trumpeter blew one blast of defiance and then fell dead drake returned the spanish volley and charged immediately the drummer beating furiously pikes levelled and swords brandished the spaniards did not wait for him to close for oxenham's party fire pikes blazing were taking them in flank out went the spaniards through the panama gate with screaming townsfolk scurrying before them bang went the gate now under english guard as drake made for the governor's house there lay a pile of silver bars such as his men had never dreamt of in all about four hundred tons of silver ready for the homeward fleet enough not only to fill but sink the pasha swan and pinnaces 
but silver was then no more to drake than it was once to solomon what he wanted was the diamonds and pearls and gold which were stored he learned in the king's treasure-house beside the bay a terrific storm now burst the fire pikes and arquebuses had to be taken under cover the wall of the king's treasure-house defied all efforts to breach it and the spaniards who had been shut into the town discovering how few the english were reformed for attack some of drake's men began to lose heart but in a moment he stepped to the front and ordered oxenham to go round and smash in the treasure-house gate while he held the plaza himself just as the men stepped off however he reeled aside and fell he had fainted from loss of blood caused by a wound he had managed to conceal there was no holding the men now they gave him a cordial after which he bound up his leg for he was a first-rate surgeon and repeated his orders as before but there were a good many wounded and with drake no longer able to lead the rest all begged to go back so back to their boats they went and over to the bastamentos or victualling island which contained the gardens and poultry runs of the nombre de dios citizens here they were visited under a flag of truce by the spanish officer commanding the reinforcement just sent across from panama he was all politeness airs and graces while trying to ferret out the secret of their real strength drake however was not to be outdone either in diplomacy or war and a delightful little comedy of prying and veiling courtesies was played out to the great amusement of the english sea-dogs finally when the time agreed upon was up the spanish officer departed pouring forth a stream of high-flown compliments which drake who was a spanish scholar answered with the like waving each other a ceremonious adieu the two leaders were left no wiser than before nombre de dios now strongly reinforced and on its guard was not an easy nut to crack but panama panama meant a risky march inland and a still riskier return by the regular treasure trail but with the help of the maroons who knew the furtive byways to a foot the thing might yet be done rance thought the game not worth the candle and retired from the partnership much to drake's delight a good preliminary stroke was made by raiding cartagena here drake found a frigate deserted by its crew who had gone ashore to see fair play in a duel fought about a seaman's mistress the old man left in charge confessed that a seville ship was round the point drake cut her out at once in spite of being fired at from the shore next in came two more spanish sail to warn cartagena that captain drake has been at nombre de dios and taken it and if a blessed bullet hadn't hit him in the leg he would have sacked it too cartagena however was up in arms already so drake put all his prisoners ashore unhurt and retired to reconsider his position leaving diego a negro fugitive from nombre de dios to muster the maroons for a raid overland to panama then drake who sank the swan and burnt his prizes because he had only men enough for the pasha and the pinnaces disappeared into a new secret harbor but his troubles were only beginning for word came that the maroons said that nothing could be done inland till the rains were over five months hence this meant a long wait however what with making supply depots and picking up prizes here and there the wet time might pass off well enough one day oxenham's crew nearly mutinied over the shortness of provisions have ye not as much as i drake called to them and as god's providence ever failed us yet within an hour a spanish vessel hove in sight making such very heavy weather of it that boarding her was out of the question but we spent not two hours in attendance till it pleased god to send us a reasonable calm 
so that we might use our guns and approach her at pleasure we found her laden with victuals which we received as scent of god's great mercy then yellow jack broke out and the men began to fall sick and die the company consisted of seventy-three men and twenty-eight of these perished of the fever among them the surgeon himself and drake's own brother but on the third of february fifteen hundred and seventy three drake was ready for the dash on panama leaving behind about twenty-five men to guard the base he began the overland march with a company of fifty all told of whom thirty-one were picked maroons the fourth day out drake climbed a forest giant on the top of the divide saw the atlantic behind him and the pacific far in front and vowed that if he lived he would sail an english ship over the great south sea two days more and the party left the protecting forest for the rolling pampas where the risk of being seen increased at every step another day's march and panama was sighted as they topped the crest of one of the bigger waves of ground a clever maroon went ahead to spy out the situation and returned to say that two recuas would leave at dusk one coming from venta cruz fifteen miles northwest of panama carrying silver and supplies and the other from panama loaded with jewels and gold then a spanish sentry was caught asleep by the advance party of maroons who smelt him out by the match of his firelock in his gratitude for being protected from the maroons this man confirmed the previous information the excitement now was most intense for the crowning triumph of a two years great adventure was at last within striking distance of the english crew drake drew them up in proper order and every man took off his shirt and put it on again outside his coat so that each would recognize the others in the night attack then they lay listening for the mule bells till presently the warning tinkle let them know that recuas were approaching from both venta cruz and panama the first or silver train from venta cruz was to pass in silence only the second or gold train from panama was to be attacked unluckily one of the englishmen had been secretly taking pulls at his flask and had just become pot valiant when a stray spanish gentleman came riding up from venta cruz the englishman sprang to his feet swayed about was tripped up by maroons and promptly sat upon but the spaniard saw his shirt reined up whipped round and galloped back to panama this took place so silently at the extreme flank in towards panama that it was not observed by drake or any other englishman presently what appeared to be the gold train came within range drake blew his whistle and all set on with glee only to find that the panama recua they were attacking was a decoy sent on to spring the trap and that the gold and jewels had been stopped the spaniards were up in arms but drake slipped away through the engulfing forest and came out on the atlantic side where he found his rear guard intact and eager for further exploits he was met by captain tetu a huguenot just out from france with seventy men tetu gave drake news of the massacre of st bartholomew and this drew the french and english protestants together they agreed to engage in further raiding of spaniards share and share alike by nationalities though drake had now only thirty-one men against tetu's seventy nombre de dios they decided was not vulnerable as all the available spanish forces were concentrated there for its defence and so they planned to seize a spanish train of gold and jewels just far enough inland to give them time to get away with the plunder before the garrison could reach them somewhere on the coast they established a base of operations and then marched overland to the panama trail and lay in wait this time the marauders were successful when the spanish train of gold and jewels came opposite the ambush drake's whistle blew the leading mules were stopped 
the rest lay down as mule trains will the guard was overpowered after killing a maroon and wounding captain tattoo and when the garrison of nombre de dios arrived a few hours later the gold and jewels had all gone for a day and a night and another day drake and his men pushed on loaded with plunder back to their rendezvous along the coast leaving tattoo and two of his devoted frenchmen to be rescued later when they arrived worn out at the rendezvous not a man was in sight drake built a raft out of unhewn tree trunks and setting up a biscuit bag as a sail pushed out with two frenchmen and one englishman till he found his boats the plunder was then divided up between the french and the english while oxenham headed a rescue party to bring tattoo to the coast one frenchman was found but tattoo and the other had been caught by spaniards the pasha was given to the accumulated spanish prisoners to sail away in the pinnaces were kept till a suitable smart sailing spanish craft was found boarded and captured to replace them whereupon they were broken up and their metal given to the maroons then in two frigates with ballast of silver and cargo of jewels and gold the thirty survivors of the adventure set sail for home within twenty-three days we passed from the cape of florida to the isles of scilly and so arrived at plymouth on sunday about sermon time august ninth fifteen hundred and seventy three at what time the news of our captain's return brought unto his friends did so speedily pass over all the church and surpass their minds with desire to see him that very few or none remained with the preacher all hastening to see the evidence of god's love and blessing towards our gracious queen and country by the fruit of our captain's labour and success soli deo gloria End of chapter six chapter seven of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven drake's encompassment of all the world when drake left for nombre de dios in the spring of fifteen hundred and seventy two spain and england were both ready to fly at each other's throats when he came back in the summer of fifteen hundred and seventy three they were all for making friends hypocritically so but friends drake's plunder stank in the nostrils of the haughty dons it was a very inconvenient factor in the diplomatic problem for elizabeth therefore drake disappeared and his plunder too he went to ireland on service in the navy his plunder was divided up in secrecy among the high and low contracting parties in fifteen hundred and seventy four the anglo-spanish scene had changed again the spaniards had been so harassed by the english sea-dogs between the netherlands and spain that philip listened to his great admiral menendez who despairing of direct attack on england proposed to seize the scilly isles and from that naval base clear out a way through all the pirates of the english channel war seemed certain but a terrible epidemic broke out in the spanish fleet menendez died and philip changed his policy again this same year john oxenham drake's old second in command sailed over to his death the spaniards caught him on the isthmus of darien and hanged him as a pirate at lima in peru in the autumn of fifteen hundred and seventy five drake returned to england with a new friend thomas doughty a soldier scholar of the renaissance clever and good company but one of those italianate englishmen who gave rise to the italian proverb anglesi italianato e diavolo incarnato an italianized englishman is the very devil doughty was patronized by the earl of essex who had great influence at court the next year fifteen hundred and seventy six is noted for the spanish fury 
philip's sea-power was so hampered by the dutch and english privateers and he was so impotent against the english navy that he could get no ready money either by loan or from america to pay his troops in antwerp these men reinforced by others therefore mutinied and sacked the whole of antwerp killing all who opposed them and practically ruining the city from which charles v used to draw such splendid subsidies the result was a strengthening of dutch resistance everywhere elizabeth had been unusually tortuous in her policy about this time but in fifteen hundred and seventy seven she was ready for another shot at spain provided always that it entailed no open war don john of austria natural son of charles v had all the shining qualities that his legitimate half-brother philip lacked he was the hero of lepanto and had offered to conquer the moors in tunis if philip would let him rule as king philip crafty cold and jealous of course refused and sent him to the netherlands instead here don john formed the still more aspiring plan of pacifying the dutch marrying mary queen of scots deposing elizabeth and reigning over all the british isles the pope had blessed both schemes but the dutch insisted on the immediate withdrawal of the spanish troops this demolished don john's plan but it pleased philip who could now ruin his brilliant brother by letting him wear himself out by trying to govern the netherlands without an army then the duke of anjou brother to the king of france came into the fast thickening plot at the head of the french rescuers of the netherlands from spain but a victorious french army in the netherlands was worse for england than even spanish rule there so elizabeth tried to support the dutch enough to annoy philip and at the same time keep them independent of the french in her desire to support them against philip indirectly she found it convenient to call drake into consultation drake then presented to sir francis walsingham his letter of commendation from the earl of essex under whom he had served in ireland whereupon secretary walsingham the first civilian who ever grasped the principle of modern sea power declared that her majesty had received divers injuries of the king of spain for which she desired revenge he showed me a plot map willing me to note down where he might be most annoyed but i refused to set my hand to anything affirming that her majesty was mortal and that if it should please god to take her majesty away that some prince might reign that might be in league with the king of spain and then would my own hand be a witness against myself elizabeth was forty-four mary queen of scots was watching for the throne plots and counterplots were everywhere shortly after this interview drake was told late at night that he should have audience of her majesty next day on seeing him elizabeth went straight to the point drake i would gladly be revenged on the king of spain for divers injuries that i have received and withal says drake craved my advice therein who told her majesty the only way was to annoy him by the indies on that he disclosed his whole daring scheme for raiding the pacific elizabeth who like her father loved a man who was a man fell in with this at once secrecy was of course essential her majesty did swear by her crown that if any within her realm did give the king of spain to understand hereof they should lose their heads therefore at a subsequent audience her majesty gave me special commandment that of all men my lord treasurer should not know of it the cautious lord treasurer burleigh was against what he considered dangerous forms of privateering and was for keeping on good terms with spanish arms and trade as long as possible mendoza lynx-eyed ambassador of spain was hoodwinked but dowdy the viper in drake's bosom was meditating mischief not exactly treason with spain but at least a breach of confidence by telling burleigh de guiris chief spanish spy in england was sorely puzzled 
drake's ostensible destination was egypt and his men were openly enlisted for alexandria the spaniards however saw far enough through this to suppose that he was really going back to nombre de dios it did not seem likely though quite possible that he was going in search of the northwest passage for martin frobisher had gone out on that quest the year before and had returned with a lump of black stone from the arctic desolation of baffin island no one seems to have divined the truth cape horn was unknown the strait of magellan was supposed to be the only opening between south america and a huge antarctic continent and its reputation for disasters had grown so terrible and rightly terrible that it had been given up as the way into the pacific the spanish way as we have seen was overland from nombre de dios to panama more or less along the line of the modern panama canal in the end drake got away quietly enough on the fifteenth of november fifteen hundred and seventy seven the court and country were in great excitement over the conspiracy between the spaniards and mary queen of scots now a prisoner of nine years standing the famous voyage of sir francis drake in the south sea and there hence about the whole globe of the earth begun in the year of our lord fifteen hundred and seventy seven well deserves its great renown drake's flotilla seems absurdly small but for its own time it was far from insignificant and it was exceedingly well found the pelican afterwards called the golden hind though his flagship was of only a hundred tons the elizabeth the swan the marigold and the benedict were of eighty fifty thirty and fifteen there were altogether less than three hundred tons and two hundred men the crews numbered a hundred and fifty the rest were gentlemen adventurers special artificers two trained surveyors musicians boys in drake's own page jack drake there was great store of wildfire chain shot harquebuses pistols corslets bows and other like weapons in great abundance neither had he omitted to make provision for ornament and delight carrying with him expert musicians rich furniture all the vessels for his table yea many belonging even to the cook-room being of pure silver and divers shows of all sorts of curious workmanship whereby the civility and magnificence of his native country might amongst all nations whithersoever he should come be the more admired sow sow west went drake's flotilla and made its landfall towards the pole antarctic off the land of devils in thirty one degrees forty minutes south northeast of montevideo frightful storms had buffeted the little ships about for weary weeks together and all hands thought they were the victims of some magician on board perhaps the italianate dowdy or else of native witchcraft from the shore the experienced old pilot who was a portuguese explained that the natives had sold themselves to devils who were kinder masters than the spaniards and that now when they see ships they cast sand into the air whereof ariseth a most gross thick fog and palpable darkness and withal horrible fearful and intolerable winds rains and storms but witchcraft was not thomas dowdy's real offence even before leaving england and after betraying elizabeth and drake to burleigh who wished to curry favour with the spanish traders rather than provoke the spanish power dowdy was busy tampering with the men a storekeeper had to be sent back for peculation designed to curtail drake's range of action then dowdy tempted officers and men talked up the terrors of magellan's strait ran down his friend's authority and finally tried to encourage downright desertion by underhand means this was too much for drake dowdy was arrested tied to the mast and threatened with dire punishment if he did not mend his ways but he would not mend his ways he had a brother on board and a friend a very crafty lawyer so stern measures were soon required drake held a sort of court-martial which condemned dowdy to death then dowdy having played his last card and lost determined to die like an officer and a gentleman 
drake solemnly pronounced him the child of death and persuaded him that he would by these means make him the servant of god doughty fell in with the idea and the former friends took the sacrament together for which master doughty gave him hearty thanks never otherwise terming him than my good captain chaplain fletcher having ended with the absolution drake and doughty sat down together as cheerfully as ever in their lives each cheering up the other and taking their leave by drinking to each other as if some journey had been in hand then drake and daddy went aside for a private conversation of which no record has remained after this doughty walked to the place of execution where like king charles the first he nothing common did or mean upon that memorable scene and so bidding the whole company farewell he laid his head on the block lo this is the end of traitors said drake as the executioner raised the head aloft drake like magellan decided to winter where he was in port st julian on the east coast of patagonia his troubles with the men were not yet over for the soldiers resented being put on an equality with the sailors and the very crafty lawyer and doughty's brother were anything but pleased with the turn events had taken then again the faint hearts murmured in their storm-beaten tents against the horrors of the awful straits so drake resolved to make things clear for good and all unfolding a document he began my masters i am a very bad orator for my bringing up hath not been in learning but what i shall speak here let every man take good notice of and let him write it down for i will speak nothing but i will answer it in england yea and before her majesty and i have it here already set down then after reminding them of the great adventure before them and saying that mutiny and dissension must stop at once he went on for by the life of god it doth even take my wits from me to think of it here is such controversy between the gentlemen and sailors that it doth make me mad to hear it i must have the gentleman to haul with the mariner and the mariner with the gentleman i would know him that would refuse to set his hand to a rope but i know there is not any such here to those whose hearts fail them he offered the marigold but let them go homeward for if i find them in my way i will surely sink them not a man stepped forward then turning to the officers he discharged every one of them for reappointment at his pleasure next he made the worst offenders the crafty lawyer included step to the front for reprimand finally producing the queen's commission he ended by a ringing appeal to their united patriotism we have set by the ears three mighty princes the sovereigns of england spain and portugal and if this voyage should not have success we should not only be a scorning unto our enemies but a blot on our country for ever what triumph would it not be for spain and portugal the like of this would never more be tried then he gave back every man his rank again explaining that he and they were all servants of her majesty together with this the men marched off loyal and obedient to their tents next week drake sailed for the much dreaded straits before entering which he changed the pelican's name to the golden hind which was the crest of sir christopher hatton one of the chief promoters of the enterprise and also one of doughty's patrons then every vessel struck her topsail to the bunt in honour of the queen as well as to show that all discoveries and captures were to be made in her sole name seventeen days of appalling danger saw them through the straits where icy squalls came rushing down from every quarter of the baffling channels but the pacific was still worse for no less than fifty-two consecutive days a furious gale kept driving them about like so many bits of driftwood the like of it no traveller hath felt neither hath there ever been such a tempest since noah's flood the little english vessels fought for their very lives in that devouring hell of waters the loneliest and most stupendous in the world the marigold went down with all hands and parson fletcher who heard their dying call thought it was a judgment at last the gale abated near cape horn where drake landed with a compass while parson fletcher set up a stone engraved with the queen's name and the date of the discovery 
deceived by the false trend of the coast shown on the spanish charts drake went a long way northwest from cape horn then he struck in northeast and picked up the chilean islands it was december fifteen hundred and seventy eight but not a word of warning had reached the spanish pacific when drake stood into valparaiso seeing a sail the crew of the grand captain of the south got up a cask of wine and beat a welcome on their drums in the twinkling of an eye gigantic tom moon was over the side at the head of a party of boarders who laid about them with a will and soon drove the spaniards below half a million dollars worth of gold and jewels was taken with this prize drake then found a place in salado bay where he could clean the golden hind while the pinnace ranged south to look for the other ships that had parted company during the two months storm these were never found the elizabeth and the swan having gone home after parting company in the storm that sank the marigold after a prolonged search the golden hind stood north again meanwhile the astounding news of her arrival was spreading dismay all over the coast where the old spanish governor's plans were totally upset the indians had just been defeated when this strange ship came sailing in from nowhere to the utter confusion of their enemies the governor died of vexation and all the spanish authorities were nearly worried to death they had never dreamt of such an invasion their crews were small their lumbering vessels very lightly armed their towns unfortified but drake went faster by sea than their news by land every vessel was overhauled taken searched emptied of its treasure and then sent back with his crew and passengers at liberty one day a watering party chanced upon a spaniard from potosi fast asleep with thirteen bars of silver by him the bars were lifted quietly and the spaniard left sleeping peacefully another spaniard suddenly came round a corner with half a ton of silver on eight llamas the indians came off to trade and drake as usual made friends with them at once he had already been attacked by other indians on both coasts but this was because the unknown english had been mistaken for the hated spaniards as he neared lima drake quickened his pace lest the great annual treasure-ship of fifteen hundred and seventy-nine should get wind of what was wrong a minor treasure-ship was found to have been cleared of all her silver just in time to balk him so he set every stitch of canvas she possessed and left her driving out to sea with two other empty prizes then he stole into lima after dark and came to anchor surrounded by spanish vessels not one of which had set a watch they were found nearly empty but a ship from panama looked promising so the pinnace started after her but was fired on and an englishman was killed drake then followed her after cutting every cable in the harbor which soon became a pandemonium of vessels gone adrift the panama ship had nothing of great value except her news which was that the great treasure ship nuestra senora de la concepcion the chiefest glory of the whole south sea was on her way to panama she had a very long start and as ill luck would have it drake got becalmed outside Calleo, where the bells rang out in wild alarm the news had spread inland and the viceroy of peru came hurrying down with all the troops that he could muster finding from some arrows that the strangers were englishmen he put four hundred soldiers into the only two vessels that had escaped the general wreck produced by drake's cutting of the cables when drake saw the two pursuing craft he took back his prize crew from the panama vessel into which he put his prisoners meanwhile a breeze sprang up and he soon drew far ahead the spanish soldiers overhauled the panama prize and gladly gave up the pursuit they had no guns of any size with which to fight the golden hind and most of them were so seasick from the heaving ground swell that they couldn't have boarded her in any case three more prizes were then taken by the swift golden hind each one had news which showed that drake was closing on the chase another week passed with every stitch of canvas set 
a fourth prize taken off cape san francisco said that the treasure-ship was only one day ahead but she was getting near to panama so every nerve was strained anew presently jack drake the captain's page yelled out sail ho and scrambled down the mainmast to get the golden chain that drake had promised to the first lookout who saw the chase it was ticklish work so near to panama and local winds might ruin all so drake in order not to frighten her trailed a dozen big empty wine jars over the stern to moderate his pace at eight o'clock the jars were cut adrift and the golden hind sprang forward with the evening breeze her crew at battle quarters and her decks all cleared for action the chase was called the spitfire by the spaniards because she was much better armed than any other vessel there but all the same her armament was nothing for her tonnage the spaniards trusted to their remoteness for protection and that was their undoing to every englishman's amazement the chase was seen to go about and calmly come to hail the golden hind which she mistook for a dispatch vessel sent after her with some message from the viceroy drake asking nothing better ran up alongside as anton her captain hailed him with ah who are you a ship of chile answered drake anton looked down on the stranger's deck to see it full of armed men from whom a roar of triumph came english strike sail then drake's whistle blew sharply and instant silence followed on which he hailed don anton strike sail signor juan de anton or i must send you to the bottom come aboard and do it yourself bravely answered anton drake's whistle blew one shrill long blast which loosed a withering volley at less than point blank range anton tried to bear away and shake off his assailant but in vain the english guns now opened on his masts and rigging down came the mizzen while a hail of english shot and arrows prevented every attempt to clear away the wreckage the dumbfounded spanish crew ran below don anton looked over side to port and there was the english pinnace from which forty english boarders were nimbly climbing up his own ship's side resistance was hopeless so anton struck and was taken aboard the golden hind there he met drake who was already taking off his armour except with patience the usage of war said drake laying his hand on anton's shoulder for all that night next day and the next night following drake sailed west with his fabulous prize so as to get well clear of the trade route along the coast what the whole treasure was has never been revealed but it certainly amounted to the equivalent of many millions at the present day among the official items were thirteen chests of pieces of eight eighteen pounds of pure gold jewels and plate twenty-six ton weight of silver and sundries unspecified as the spanish pilot's son looked over the rail at this astounding sight the englishman called out to say that his father was no longer the pilot of the old spitfire but of the new spit silver the prisoners were no less gratified than surprised by drake's kind treatment he entertained don anton at a banquet took him all over the golden hind and entrusted him with a message to don martin the traitor of san juan de Ulua. this was to say that if don martin hanged any more englishmen as he had just hanged oxenham he should soon be given a present of two thousand spanish heads then drake gave every spanish officer and man a personal gift proportioned to his rank put all his accumulated prisoners aboard the emptied treasure-ship wished them a prosperous voyage and better luck next time furnished the brave don anton with a letter of protection in case he should fall in with an english vessel and after many expressions of goodwill on both sides sailed north the voyage made while the poor spitsilver treasure ship turned sadly east and steered for panama lima panama and nombre de dios were in wild commotion at the news and every sailor and soldier that the spaniards had was going to and fro uncertain whether to attack or to defend and still more distracted as to the most elusive english whereabouts one good spanish captain don pedro sarmiento de gamboa was all for going north his instinct telling him that drake would not come back among the angry bees after stealing all the honey 
but by the time the captain-general of new spain had made up his mind to take one of the many wrong directions he had been thinking of drake was already far on his way north to found new albion drake's triumph over all difficulties had won the hearts of his men more than ever before while the capture of the treasure-ship had done nothing to loosen the bonds of discipline don francisco de zarati wrote a very intimate account of his experience as a prisoner on board the golden hind the english captain is one of the greatest mariners at sea alike from his skill and his powers of command his ship is a very fast sailor and her men are all skilled hands of warlike age and so well trained that they might be old soldiers of the italian tertias the crack corps of the age of spanish eyes he is served with much plate and has all possible kinds of delicacies and scents many of which he says the queen of england gave him none of the gentlemen sit or cover in his presence without first being ordered to do so they dine and sup to the music of violins his galleon carries about thirty guns and a great deal of ammunition this was in marked contrast to the common spanish practice even on the atlantic side the greedy exploiters of new spain grudged every ton of armament and every well-trained fighting sailor both on account of the expense and because this form of protection took up room they wished to fill with merchandise the result was of course that they lost more by capture than they gained by evading the regulation about the proper armament his ship is not only of the very latest type but sheathed before copper sheathing was invented some generations later the teredo worm used to honeycomb unprotected hulls in the most dangerous way john hawkins invented the sheathing used by drake a good thick tar and hair sheeting clamped on with elm northwest to coronado then to aguatulco then fifteen hundred miles due west brought drake about that distance south by east of the modern san francisco here he turned north northwest and giving the land a wide berth went on to perhaps the latitude of vancouver island always looking for the reverse way through america by the fabled northwest passage either there was the most extraordinary june ever known in california and oregon or else the narratives of those on board have all been hopelessly confused for freezing rain is said to have fallen on the night of june the third in the latitude of forty two degrees in forty eight degrees there followed the most vile thick and stinking fogs with still more numbing cold the meat froze when taken off the fire the wet rigging turned to icicles six men could hardly do the work of three fresh from the tropics the crews were unfit for going any farther a tremendous nor'wester settled the question anyway and drake ran south to thirty eight degrees thirty minutes where in what is now drake's bay he came to anchor just north of san francisco not more than once if ever at all and that a generation earlier had europeans been in northern california the indians took the englishmen for gods whom they knew not whether to love or fear drake with the essential kindliness of most and the magnetic power of all great born commanders soon won the natives confidence but their admiration as men ravished in their minds was rather overpowering for after a kind of most lamentable weeping and crying out they came forward with various offerings for the new-found gods prostrating themselves in humble adoration and tearing their breasts and faces in a wild desire to show the spirit of self-sacrifice drake and his men all protestants were horrified at being made what they considered idols so kneeling down they prayed aloud raising hands and eyes to heaven hoping thereby to show the heathen where the true god lived drake then read the bible and all the englishmen sang psalms the indians observing the end of every pause with one voice still cried oh greatly rejoicing in our exercises as this impromptu service ended the indians gave back all the presents drake had given them and retired in attitudes of adoration 
in three days more they returned headed by a medicine man whom the english call the mace-bearer with the slow and stately measure of a mystic dance this great high priest of heathen rites advanced chanting a sort of litany both litany and dance were gradually taken up by tens by hundreds and finally by all the thousands of the devotees who addressed drake with shouts of hayo and invested him with a headdress of rare plumage and a necklace of quaint beads it was in fact a native coronation without a soul to doubt the divine right of their new king drake's protestant scruples were quieted by thinking to what good end god had brought this to pass and what honour and profit it might bring to our country in time to come so in the name and to the use of her most excellent majesty he took the sceptre crown and dignity and proclaimed an english protectorate over the land he called new albion he then set up a brass plate commemorating this proclamation and put an english coin in the middle so that the indians might see elizabeth's portrait and armorial device the exaltation of the ecstatic devotees continued till the day he left they crowded in to be cured by the touch of his hand those were the times in which the sovereign was expected to cure the king's evil by a touch they also expected to be cured by inhaling the divine breath of any one among the english gods the chief narrator adds that the gods who pleased the indians most braves and squaws included were commonly the youngest of us which shows that the human was not quite forgotten in the all divine when the time for sailing came the devotees were inconsolable they not only in a sudden did lose all mirth joy glad countenance pleasant speeches agility of body and all pleasure but with sighs and sorrowings they poured out woeful complaints and moans with bitter tears and wringing of their hands and tormenting of themselves the last the english saw of them was the whole devoted tribe assembled on the hill around a sacrificial fire whence they implored their gods to bring their heaven back to earth from california drake sailed to the philippines and then to the moluccas where the portuguese had if such a thing were possible outdone even the spaniards in their fiendish dealings with the natives lopez de mosquito viler than his pestilential name had murdered the sultan who was then his guest chopped up the body and thrown it into the sea Baybar, the sultan's son had driven out the portuguese from the island of ternate and was preparing to do likewise from the island of tidore when drake arrived Baybar then offered drake for queen elizabeth the complete monopoly of the trade in spices if only drake would use the golden hind as the flagship against the portuguese drake's reception was full of oriental state and sultan Baybar was so entranced by drake's musicians that he sat all afternoon among them in a boat towed by the golden hind but it was too great a risk to take a hand in this new war with only fifty-six men left so drake traded for all the spices he could stow away and concluded a sort of understanding which formed the sheet anger of english diplomacy in eastern seas for another century to come elizabeth was so delighted with this result that she gave drake a cup still at the family seat at nutwell court in devonshire engraved with a picture of his reception by the sultan Baybar of ternate leaving ternate the golden hind beat to and fro among the tortuous and only half-known channels of the archipelago till the ninth of january fifteen hundred and eighty when she bore away before a roaring trade wind with all sails set and so far as drake could tell a good clear course for home but suddenly without a moment's warning there was a most terrible shock the gallant ship reared like a stricken charger plunged forward grinding her trembling hull against the rocks and then lay pounding out her life upon a reef drake and his men at once took in half the straining sails then knelt in prayer then rose to see what could be done by earthly means to their dismay there was no holding ground on which to get an anchor fast and warp the vessel off the lead could find no bottom anywhere aft all night long the golden hind remained fast caught in this insidious death-trap 
at dawn parson fletcher preached a sermon and administered the blessed sacrament then drake ordered ten tons overboard cannon cloves and provisions the tide was now low and she sewed seven feet her draught being thirteen and the depth of water only six still she kept an even keel as the reef was to leeward and she had just sail enough to hold her up but at high tide in the afternoon there was a lull and she began to heel over towards the unfathomable depths just then however a quiver ran through her from stem to stern an extra sail that drake had ordered up caught what little wind there was and with the last throb of the rising tide she shook herself free and took the water as quietly as if her hull was being launched there were perils enough to follow dangers of navigation the arrival of a portuguese fleet that was only just eluded and all the ordinary risks of travel in times when what might be called the official guide to voyagers opened with the ominous advice first make thy will but the greatest had now been safely passed meanwhile all sorts of rumours were rife in spain new spain and england drake had been hanged that rumour came from the hanging of john oxenham at lima the golden hind had foundered that tale was what winter captain of the elizabeth was not altogether unwilling should be thought after his own failure to face another great antarctic storm he had returned in fifteen hundred and seventy eight news from peru and mexico came home in fifteen hundred and seventy nine but no drake so as fifteen hundred and eighty wore on his friends began to despair the spaniards and portuguese rejoiced while burleigh with all who found drake an inconvenience in their diplomatic way began to hope that perhaps the sea had smoothed things over in august the london merchants were thrown into consternation by the report of drake's incredible captures for their own merchant fleet was just then off for spain they waited on the council who soothed them with the assurance that drake's voyage was a purely private venture so far as prizes were concerned with this diplomatic quibble they were forced to be content but worse was soon to follow the king of portugal died philip's army marched on lisbon immediately and all the portuguese possessions were added to the already overgrown empire of spain worse still this annexation gave philip what he wanted in the way of ships for portugal had more than spain the great armada was now expected to be formed against england unless elizabeth's miraculous diplomacy could once more get her clear of the fast entangling coils to add to the general confusion this was also the year in which the pope sent his picked jesuits to england in which elizabeth was carrying on her last great international flirtation with ugly dissipated francis of anjou brother to the king of france into this imbroglio sailed the golden hind with ballast of silver and cargo of gold is her majesty alive and well said drake to the first sail outside of plymouth sound ay ay she is my master answered the skipper of a fishing smack but there's a deal o sickness here in plymouth on which drake ready for any excuse to stay afloat came to anchor in the harbour his wife pretty mary newman from the banks of tabby took boat to see him as did the mayor whose business was to warn him to keep quiet till his course was clear so drake wrote off to the queen and all the councillors who were on his side the answer from the councillors was not encouraging so he warped out quietly and anchored again behind drake's island in the sound but presently the queen's own message came commanding him to an audience at which she said she would be pleased to view some of the curiosities he had brought from foreign parts straight on that hint he started up to town with spices diamonds pearls and gold enough to win any woman's pardon and consent the audience lasted six hours meanwhile the council sat without any of drake's supporters and ordered all the treasure to be impounded in the tower but leicester walsingham and hatton all members of drake's syndicate refused to sign while elizabeth herself the managing director suspended the order till her further pleasure should be known the spanish ambassador did burn with passion against drake the council was distractingly divided the london merchants trembled for their fleet but elizabeth was determined that the blow to philip should hurt him 
as much as it could without producing an immediate war while down among drake's own west countrymen the case was clear in sea divinity as similar cases had often been before tremaine a devonshire magistrate and friend of the syndicate could hardly find words to express his contentment with drake whom he called a man of great government and that by the rules of god and his book elizabeth decided to stand by drake she claimed what was true that he had injured no actual place or persons of the king of spain's nothing but property afloat appropriate for reprisals all england knew the story of ulua and approved of reprisals in accordance with the spirit of the age and the queen had a special grievance about ireland where the spaniards were entrenched in smerwick thus adding to the confusion of a rebellion that never quite died down at any time philip explained that the smearwick spaniards were there as private volunteers elizabeth answered that drake was just the same the english tide at all events was turning in his favour the indefatigable stowe chronicler of london records that the people generally applauded his wonderful long adventures and rich prizes his name and fame became admirable in all places the people swarming daily in the streets to behold him vowing hatred to all that misliked him the golden hind had been brought round to london where she was the greatest attraction of the day finally on the fourth of april fifteen hundred and eighty one elizabeth went on board in state to a banquet finer than has ever been seen in england since king henry the eighth said the furious spanish ambassador in his report to philip but this was not her chief offence in spanish eyes for here surrounded by her court and in the presence of an enormous multitude of her enthusiastic subjects she openly defied the king of spain he hath demanded drake's head of me she laughed aloud and here i have a gilded sword to strike it off with that she bade drake kneel then handing the sword to marchemont the special envoy of her french suitor francis of anjou she ordered him to give the accolade this done she pronounced the formula of immemorial fame i bid thee rise sir francis drake End of chapter seven